Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 16. This tutorial will focus on accounting for different kinds of shared transactions. This tutorial has five main learning objectives. The first is going to be to review accounting for lump sum share issues. The second, to review accounting for share subscriptions. Third, review accounting for stock dividends. Fourth, review how to account for repurchases and cancellation of common shares. And fifth, to review accounting for basic cash dividends. This tutorial is based on the PIT Publishing Limited example, so please make sure that you have downloaded and read the data and the requirements. We will start with the first requirement, which will be to prepare the journal entries necessary to record all the following transactions. The first one that we're going to have to deal with is a lump sum share issue. When the company issues shares for a lump sum, it's going to debit cash. Pitt is going to receive 165,000 in cash. But the problem is the company is issuing both common and preferred shares. So what has to happen is the company will have to determine how much of that 165,000 to allocate. The way that's done, we use the stated market price to determine what the market value is and then prorate accordingly. According to the information, there are 5,000 preferred shares that are outstanding with a market price of $8. So the market value of the preferred shares alone is $40,000. There are 10,000 common shares with a market price of $12. So that gives a market value of $120,000. Combined, that's a total market value of 160000 And then what we do to determine the percentage that each represents is basically we will just take each one and divide by the 160000 So if you take 40 divided by 160000 that's 25%. And if we take 120 divided by 160000 that's 75%. Then, of course, they must add up to 1.0 or 100%. What happens then is we'll take the $165,000 and we will allocate that amount based on the prorated market values. So 25% times 165,000 is 41,250 that gets allocated to the preferred shares. And the 75% that was left over is allocated to common shares. Never ever is there any kind of gain or loss or any contributed surplus on the purchase of shares, any of that, or the issues of shares. Next, we'll move on to requirements uh, 1B and C, which deals with the share subscriptions. In transaction B, the company issues 10,000 share subscriptions at uh, $15. What happens is the company will basically uh, debit share subscriptions receivable for $150,000. And at the same time, debit common share subscribed for $150,000. This is a temporary equity account that sits in equity until the shares are fully subscribed or something happens, the shares lapse or whatever. Eventually, this has to be flushed out. But because the common shares are not issued yet, this credit has to go somewhere. And it's not common shares because the shares are not yet issued. So this is a parking spot. At the same time, the company receives $10, so like cash payment or deposit on the share subscriptions, debit cash, and credit subscriptions receivable for $100,000. So what I've done here is I've just shown two key accounts, one for the common share subscribed and one for the subscriptions receivable. The balances will start at zero, and as you can see what happens here, there is an immediate credit in the first transaction for $150,000. At the same time, there is a debit to the subscription receivable, and then an immediate credit for the 100000 Next, there's a second payment of cash on the share subscriptions, except that only 9500 make that final payment, that second payment. So we'll take the 10000 original minus the 500 that gives us 9500 times $5 is a debit to cash, $47,500, and a credit to subscriptions receivable for $47,500. At the end of this transaction, the balance in our subscriptions receivable account right here is $2,500. And after the first transaction, the balance in the share subscribed is still only $150. Then we hit the point where we can issue the shares 
the ones that are fully subscribed, what will happen is we will now debit the common share subscribed account, this temporary account here. And you see this debit of 142,500 right here. And then finally, a credit to common shares. So this gets moved from the common share subscribed, gets moved into common shares. And that's a, based on the total of 9,500 shares that are fully subscribed at $15. Now what happens is you can see here there's a balance, there's a leftover of $7,500. And there's a leftover balance in the share subscriptions receivable of $2,500. Now after the shares are fully subscribed, the balances have to be zero. So that's where this second part of the last transaction comes in is because there were 10,000 initial subscriptions, but only 9,500 actually uh, fulfilled the obligation. There's 500 shares that are forfeited. We're going to take 500 shares times $5 because that's the remaining $2,500 in the share subscription receivable account. And we're going to credit that account for $2,500. We have a balance in the share subscribed for $7,500. So we're going to debit that to get rid of it. And the balance of $5,000 to make our debits and credits goes to a contributed surplus account. And that's basically for defaulted share subscriptions. And we can show that $5,000 is calculated as 500 forfeited shares times the $10 initial payment. So the people that thought that they were going to subscribe paid $10 to subscribe. Then they decided for whatever reason not to. And therefore, their initial payment of $10 is forfeited. And we have a nice balance of zero at the end of both of these transactions. And now we'll be able to do transactions E, F, and G uh, all together here. So transaction E, the company basically declares a three-for-one stock split. Now, when it comes to stock splits, guess what? There's no entry, but it's good practice to have a, a memorandum or a note. So what happens is there's an additional 89,000 shares issued, but how we get there is we want to reconstruct the balance in the number of common shares, right? Normally we use T accounts to uh, construct accounts for a dollar values, but we can use it to track the number of shares. There were 25,000 shares outstanding at the beginning. There were 10,000 shares issued as part of that lump sum purchase in transaction A, and then another 9,500 shares from the subscriptions. So that gave a total of 44,500 shares and then times three for the split gives a total of 133,500 shares that are needed at the end. Well, that means that there was an additional 89,000 shares, 133,500 minus 44,500, that's an additional 89,000 shares that are issued. Then in transaction F, the company decides to declare a 10% stock dividend. So what happens with stock dividends is they come right out of retained earnings. Companies will issue cash dividends or stock dividends. When companies don't have cash to issue as dividends, they may issue stock dividends. So in this case, we're going to debit retained earnings, right, and credit a stock dividend distributable account. This is also a temporary account until the stock dividends are actually distributed. This is a parking spot. And what we have here is 133,500 shares. That's what the balance is in the number of shares times the 10% stock dividend times $13, which is the average market price. And what comes out of retained earnings is the market value of those shares. Once the stock dividend is distributed, we will debit the stock dividend distributable account. First it's credited, then it's debited, so they cancel each other out and we're going to credit the common shares. If we round out the work that we're doing here on the right, where we start with a number of shares, now we can also see what we have for the share value. Those initial 25,000 shares had a book value of $265,000. The 10,000 that were issued, right, that lump sum, $123,750, and then the 9,500 shares at the $15 it was 142,500 in the subscription. That's a total common share value of 531,250 before the stock dividend. And then now the stock dividend is added into that. So before anything else, the balance in that account is now $704,800. All right, now we'll move on to share transaction H, which is the share repurchase. 
But before we do anything, I want to bring back these two accounts. So the T account for the number of common shares and the T account for the dollars. What we have are 146,850 shares and $704,800 in value. What happens is we can now determine what the average issue price is for the shares. 704,800 divided by 146,850 shares is $4.80 a share. Now what happens is the company repurchases 15,000 shares. That's a total amount of 71,992. And so here's what happens. The company is going to debit the common share account for that 71,992. The problem is that all these shared transactions have different values. The lump sum issue is not for the same amount as the 25,000 that were initial, and then the share subscriptions are a very different amount altogether. And then you have the split, which reduces the value and all this kind of stuff. So we need to come up with the average issue price. So we'll debit that 71,992. We'll credit cash for $90,000. We're going to debit contributed surplus for $13,000. Now this is an existing balance in contributed surplus because there was 8,000 to begin with. And then in transaction B, there was another 5,000 that was added to contributed surplus for those forfeited options. So that gives a balance of $13,000. You can tell here that the company is paying more to repurchase its own shares than the average issue price, right? Because 90,000 is greater than 71,992. And there's a debit that's necessary for this transaction to balance. However, we must first look to see if there's any existing balance in contributed surplus and use that up first. So you see in transaction H here, what's happening is we are going to use up all of that $13,000. So that's why we're debiting contributed surplus here for $13,000. And then the remainder, the leftover, gets debited to retained earnings. And now we can wrap up with the two final transactions, the dividends and the closing increase. So this is pretty easy. The company uh, basically issues a total dividend of $300,000. What will happen first is always the preferred shareholders get theirs first. So there are 20,000 preferred shares. They get a $5 dividend. That's 100,000. So the dividend payable for preferred shares is 100,000. And the balance is what goes to common shareholders. 300,000 total dividends minus 100,000 preferred is 300,000. And the last one, of course, uh, just has to do with closing the income summary to retain earnings. The problem says that the company had net income of 875000 so technically that should be closed out to retain earnings. Okay, the second requirement is going to be to prepare the shareholders' equity section of the balance sheet for PIP publishing. So, a partial balance sheet in good form, right, includes the company's name, shareholders' equity, section of the balance sheet, and as at December 31st, the first thing you see in the equity section of the balance sheet is a section for contributed capital, or sometimes called paid-in capital. The correct order is preferred shares first. So we have preferred shares. They're $5, non-cumulative, 25,000 authorized, and 20,000 issued. These are necessary disclosures. Well, what I've done here is I've shown key accounts for the number of preferred shares and the dollar value, how we got to that. So we had a beginning balance of 15,000. And then in the lump sum issue in transaction A, we added another five. So that gives us 20,000 at the end. And the dollar value is based on the same elements. There were 15,000 shares with a balance sheet value of $115,000. The lump sum purchase added in another 41,250 on those 5,000 shares, giving us 156,250. Next up is the common shares. We'll bring back the T accounts for the common shares, the number of them, and the dollar value of them. There are 131,850 shares at a carrying value of $632,808. So we show for our common shares, we have 300,000 authorized, 131,850 issued, and the carrying value is 632,808. 
Next up is contributed surplus. Bringing up the contributed surplus T account, you can see that the ending balance is zero, right? We started with 8,000. We added another 5,000 from the forfeited share subscriptions, but then took the 13,000 out. So you don't actually have to show uh, a balance of zero here unless you're showing comparatives. And contributed surplus is part of contributed capital, right? It's a common mistake students do is don't include this properly in contributed capital. So now what we do is we show what the subtotal is for total contributed capital. So between the preferred shares, the common shares, and the contributed surplus, for which there's none, we have a balance of $789,058. The last thing we need is the retained earnings. And so what I've done here is I've produced a T account that traces through. We have a $351,000 beginning balance. There was the stock dividend. And then this was from the repurchase and cancellation of shares, 5008 that's another debit. And then 300000 in dividends that were paid out, and then the net income. So that gives us an ending balance of 747442 and that's what we have for everything doing. This just now cleans it up, takes away all the color, and here's what we have for our partial balance sheet, so the shareholders' equity section. The so total shareholders' equity, 1,536,500, consisting of $789,058 in contributed capital, and $747,442 in retained earnings. Okay, so now let's wrap up with some key points to remember. When it comes to lump sum purchases, the purchase amount is allocated based on prorated market values of different types of shares or classes. So if you have class A and class B shares, you prorate on, the, on their respective prorated basis, common shares, preferred shares, etc. In share subscription transactions, share accounts are not adjusted until they're fully subscribed. So what we saw here is we set up that temporary common share subscriptions account only the subscribed shares are moved from that account to the common share account with the remaining balance either refunded or forfeited. Next, any stock splits or reverse stock split transactions have no journal entries or special accounting memorandums only. It's the stock dividends that have special accounting. So if we have a stock dividend, the stock dividend is debited to retained earnings and credited to a stock dividend distributable account, not payable, distributable account upon declaration when it's based on the market price or market value of the shares. Once they're declared, the stock dividend distributable account is transferred to the relevant common shares. Next, when it comes to share repurchases, the common share account is debited for the average book value at the time of the repurchase, and that calculation can be, this is basically the total common share dollars divided by the total number of common shares to get the average. Gains and losses on share transactions are never recorded. Companies cannot recognize profits or losses on any transactions related to their own share. So we don't have a gain on repurchase, we don't have a loss on repurchase. And quite often you see students do that is they, they take the balance between cash and the, the share price and then, you know, adjust the gain or loss account. That's not the case. You can't do that. What happens in those cases is when you have a repurchase for an amount less than the average book value, then that results in a credit to contributed surplus. The entire amount goes to contributed surplus. In a situation where the company repurchases shares for an amount greater, this situation that we had in this example, the company paid $90,000 for shares that had an average book value of just over $70,000. There's a two-step process. The first thing we do is look for any existing balance in the relevant contributed surplus account. Because if you have share transactions for common shares, then you can only use a contributed surplus for common shares. You can't use any contributed surplus for preferred shares. So we debit any existing balance in the relevant contributed surplus account first, and then any remaining amount goes to retained earnings. And the contributed surplus accounts for any preferred shares or common shares must remain separate. We don't mix up contributed surplus accounts for different types of shares. And that's it. That concludes tutorial 16. As usual, if you need more information or problems, go to the course materials or your course site. We hope you found this tutorial useful.